Durant pull up jumper. Off the rim and in. Oh! And the Thunder win! Oh, come on, let's sing the Thunder song. All right. When, when you hear the sound of thunder, don't you get too scared. Just grab your thunder buddy and say these magic words. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Thunder Buddies podcast. I'm Anthony Slater. We got Darnell Mayberry on the phone and we have Barry Trammell in the studio. Used to be kind of a regular, was definitely a regular in the playoffs on this podcast. I've been ostracized. That's that's false. I mean, I think from from my opinion, you just it's early in the season. You were doing a lot of football. We didn't want to put too much on your plate. Remember how much we had you on in the playoffs when you were focused on the NBA? I feel bad for saying I was ostracized. Thank you. You guys have honored me immensely. Well, good. I don't know how many times I've been on, but I know how many times I've been on a college football blog. I mean, a college football podcast. Not many. Still zero. Still zero. Still zero. Wow. Um, well, anyway, we're going to obviously talk some thunder today. The whole time. The thunder. They're playing. I think, honestly, I think that was the best two game stretch we've seen yeah, from them. Probably. The, all season. Orlando first. stinks, but, but that's what you ought to do. That's what the old Thunder used to do to teams like that. Yeah. Um, we will get to that uh, for all the people that want to hear that. But, you know, obviously, there's, you know, it's kind of become a, a big story, I'd say, uh, within media circles. It was the Russell Westbrook on Friday night after he drops one of his best games ever, 15. 17 and 17, or 17, 17, 15, 17, however you yeah, want to do it. 17, 15, 17. Uh, a Ray John Rondo line, a Magic Johnson type line. Um, and then obviously everyone's probably seen the video after he talks about, you know, he answers every question with just good execution. And then Barry uh, kind of asks him what's going on wrong. And he, you know, he says, I don't like you, Barry, basically. He didn't say my name. He didn't. I he don't didn't. like you. And the funny thing is, I mean, the, it has been introduced to people like, hey, like, look at look at this video, what he did. He's been doing this for about two weeks. He hasn't yeah, not That's what you not said si- on that road trip. He's, he was doing some of that. Look, this is, this is where it started. It started, he, like, about two weeks ago in the Phoenix game, uh, he gets ejected. Right. At yeah. home. He gets ejected, and this is what, why Which I think he started teams, doing it. Yeah. Um, but the, they made him stay around and talk to the media. He, man, he might have left in the third. He, he probably would have left right after – his team was done with their post game talk and not talk with the media. They made him stay around and talk. He clearly did not want to talk. He probably didn't want to get fined. He didn't want to say anything regarding the altercation. So all he said in his post game comments were, "It was a good win for us." You know, Darnell. Everyone was asking about, uh, you know, the situation. Why did Markeith Morris do that? And he just said, "It was a good win for us. It was a good win for us." And then following that, I mean, I kind of think he was like, "You know what? That's maybe that's just the best way to go about it from now on." <laughs> And just don't answer that question. They won't really want to talk to me. Uh, so he did it at practice last week. And then, Darnell, you were in Houston. He kind of did it in Houston, right? Yeah, but I didn't stick around to see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's not much there of a reason. There are wise men among us. Yeah, I mean, he did, it, he did it so bad in practice the other day that after four questions, nobody asked another question. And they're like, anyone else? And, you know. He's like, really? That's all four questions. I was like, why? You know, why would we ask you another question? Um, and then obviously the big one was in Phoenix. Just, I guess uh, Darnell. D- wait, Darnell. He he was good last night though in Orlando, right? Yeah, he was superb last night. You know, he, and his superb is still kind of ordinary for most everyone else. But uh, he filled it. I believe it was seven questions. He answered them all as thoroughly as he possibly can. Apparently. Uh, at least for what we've come to know, come to know as uh, as thorough from Russell Westbrook, and he was good. You know, I mean, I thought he was going to try to do the Marshawn Lynch thing again, uh, because at least to his credit, when he did it Friday against Golden State, he did it after a, a great performance, just like he did it after a bad performance or one in which he got ejected. So at least he was consistent. So uh, if he's going to do it, I say just do it, as opposed to only doing it when you have bad games or play poorly and not doing it when you play well. Anyway, I think the biggest thing I want to dispel on this podcast, especially because we have Barry in here today, and you know he's kind of been at the center of it because that was directed to you, although I believe he's, you are one of many he doesn't like in the media, uh, is, that, is that we're mad about it. You know, We're angry that he did it. I'm not angry. I mean, he's honestly, th- through those two things, he gave us more post-game quote. Like, I've used more... Mo- Russell Westbrook quotes in the last two weeks than I ever have on this beat, because um, he was never like great, like like you mentioned. 
it's his prerogative. I mean, we, we're just bringing to the public, hey, this is how he acts. Like, you want to know about your star? This is how he treats us. Well, I'm not mad about it. I, I took no offense because, like, like, I told him, I said, are you mad at Nick Gallo also? Yeah. When he's answering Nick, he didn't answer my questions the way he did because he doesn't like me. Mm-hmm. He's mad about something else. He's upset with something else or he's discovered some new because he was answering Nick the same way and he, by his own admission, loves Nick. So I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't upset. In fact, I actually, I told the Thunder this. I took it as a positive sign because he looked me in the eye when he talked to me. Yeah. He usually doesn't do that. So, you know, I, I thought there was, I thought there was at least grounds for, uh, to start a dialogue. You know, I don't know what he's upset with me about, other than I assume it's the Scott Brooks column from a week ago. I don't. But I, that's, the only, I don't, that's the only possible thing it could be. It's the I, only possible thing it could be. I just don't think he likes that we're allowed to go into his locker room. He's very protective of his locker room. I don't think he likes that we're allowed to go in there, and I don't think he likes that we're allowed to ask him questions specifically about injuries, coming back. He's always hated those yeah. questions. He just I don't think he understands why we're allowed to ask him kind of you know personal questions about how he played. Meanwhile, I mean, you know, he can't ask. I mean, I guess he can, but why he doesn't want to. But why we're, I think that's his biggest issue. Like, why are we allowed to do the jobs that we yeah, do? I mean, I, and that's legit. I mean, yeah. I can sort of understand that. You know that, what I mean? But I'm just saying, I don't know what he possibly, why I he singled me out and said, it, I don't like you. He singled you out because you were the first person to question why he was doing the oh, Marshawn no, Lynch you th- So you think he I, said that just because I, I'm saying, yes, what's wrong? I, seriously, if Darnell had said, hey, what's wrong? Or if I had said, hey, what's wrong? Or, you know, somebody else. <laughs> that's possible. I think he would have said, yeah, that's the same possible. thing. I really do. Uh, Darnell, your thoughts on that? Yeah, it had nothing to do with Barry. Uh, I, oh, I should say little to do with Barry. You know, we're we've we've done some, we've written some things. We haven't done anything, but we've written some things, uh, negative things, critical things about the Thunder, and at the Oklahoma, and we've been the writers at the Oklahoma, and they haven't liked it. You know, they're not supposed to like it. If people come and criticize you on your job, you're not going to like it. So. Um, you know, I think it, it goes back to, you know, some of the things that Westbrook experienced throughout his career. People calling him, uh, you know, a, not a point guard. People questioning his decision-making. You know, the headline last year in the playoffs obviously didn't help our cause at all, uh, even though that was on, on Kevin Durant. You know, those guys are tighter than probably anyone on the team at this point. Uh, and, and, you know, he probably looked at us as taking a shot at his guy. And ever since then, you know, some things have been a little rocky uh, with him and, and, and some other players on the Thunder. But you know, I think it's just a culmination of things. I don't think it's just one particular thing or one particular person. It's, it's a little bit of everything. Yeah, and, I mean, we, we're in a high-stress environment with this, with this team, and it's a very high-stress season for this team as far as they've had a ton of injuries. They're 20-20. and 20, They're fighting for their playoff lives. They've had struggles. Uh, particularly lately, not the last two games counting, and it's high pressure because of where they are as a franchise. This, this is, you know, their time is supposed to be now, and the clock is ticking. Kevin, you know, with the Kevin Durant free agency thing, this is supposed to be a team. It's, it's not this fun-loving young team that's, you know, just suddenly on the stage. It's here now, and and I just think the pressure has something to do with it. The fact that hey, they aren't playing well, so what are we going to do? We're going to write about them not playing well. Uh, I just think it's it's part of the job. I can understand why there's friction from their side of things. You know, if people wrote, you know, about me not doing my job, well, I probably wouldn't, you know, necessarily like them too much. Um, but from our side of things, we got to write that stuff. Yeah. I, it, to, and one of the things that happens is this, guys. The NBA season is so long. Mm-hmm. And the access to these players is so good. Virtually, you know, every day or almost every day for eight or nine months. Yeah. Durant and Westbrook particularly talk to the media or or supposed to talk to the media and usually do. And it's just set up to where it's not going to go, you know, it's just not going to go glowingly, especially for somebody that doesn't like to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, you get around the Lakers and you, you know, when we we had the two playoff series with Thunder and Lakers and we, we got to see the Lakers on a daily basis, a lot of those guys enjoyed it and they didn't see it as drudgery. They didn't see it as a duty. They just thought, oh, it's a chance for me to get my message out. So, uh, if, But if, if you do see it as drudgery, it can wear on you, and things bubble over. Now, a lot of people are better equipped at that than others. 
you know, I, I'm not sure Kevin Durant's more fired up about the media than, than Russell Westbrook is, but Durant's personality is sort of predisposed to, you know, go along with people and yeah. get along. He's just more of a charming guy. Russell Westbrook is more of a, you know, confrontational type of personality. So things are bound to boil over. So, and, like I said, I didn't take that personally the other night. No, no. I think, and I think Dur- along with being more charming, I think Durant's a little bit more aware and concerned about his public image and what's out there. I don't think Westbrook really cares. I mean, you know, it's like, do you think Westbrook's watching them play that video on Sports Center? Like, I probably shouldn't have done that. I think he's like, <laughs> I don't really like the guy. So I told him. I mean, there just happened to be a camera on. Uh, uh, so I'm, yeah, he, he can he can do no wrong in his mind. I mean, that's just the way he's wired. I mean, we've probably all grown up with people like that, or to this day, know people like that in our lives. But um, Barry, the one thing you'll say, and I do agree with you, the access is great in the NBA, and we're a little spoiled by that. I don't envy it at all the college guys and what they go through. Uh, you know, having access to players maybe once a week, um, if they're lucky, sometimes, and. But, but I, I won't use that as an excuse, though, because the interview that Westbrook did last night in Orlando that I said he was superb in? Yes. Seven questions. Guess how long those seven questions took for him to get in and get out? One, one minute, 48 seconds. Okay, 238. 238. 148. That's what I'm saying. If this were the price is right, you'd both be wrong. You both went over. Anthony, you were closer. <laughs> over. <laughs> A minute, 30 seconds. 90 seconds to Watner. Great day. 90 seconds it took him to get in and get out of that media session after the game. So when we seconds. talk about access and, you know, maybe over access and, and having too much access to these guys, it's not killing you to talk for 90 seconds and fulfill your obligation and move on. No, and I mean, you know, even though he doesn't like it, I mean, we got to give him credit. 98% of the times in his career he has gone in, answered the questions, to you know, maybe not to the best visibility, but you know, to a reasonable point, and then you know, got out. He doesn't like doing it, and I understand that. Uh, but he usually doesn't. It sounds like moving forward, at least on most nights, he probably will do it. But you know what hey, else? Hey, before, you, before are, you, are you about to move on, Slater? I was about to move on, but go ahead. Yeah, b- before you move on, uh, and you know, I brought this up to you guys before we came on, just to give you an idea of what happened. Something happened in, in the game. Early in the game in Orlando last night, Westbrook got into it with a fan. And I'll bring it up now just to, to show. It kind of goes back to what you said, Slater, about how, you know, we're trying to dispel this theory that, you know, we're frustrated by it or we're just trying to, like, make him out to be a bad guy or have some sort of axe to grind. It's not that. He's trying more to shed light on his personality uh, and, and say, hey, this is who he is. Barry wrote a terrific blog uh, earlier this today about, you know, wanting to know who Russell Westbrook is, and 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 not just for himself, but for the fans. Um, and and I think the fans see it as, oh, just the stupid reporters. Uh, you know, they're asking dumb questions anyway. You know, I wouldn't want to do that either. And they're always going to side with Russell Westbrook, and that's fine. Or just the players in general, and that's fine. Uh, but there was an altercation last night, a little bit of an altercation. You know, there was it wasn't physical or anything, but there was an argument that took place between Russell and a fan sitting courtside. Uh, at the Magic game yesterday. And so what happened basically was uh, someone made a great play while, uh, while Russell was on the bench. And when he comes out, he generally sits toward the end of the bench, if not at the very end of the bench. So he's right there next to fans who are sitting on the, seated right there on the court um, aside, adjacent to the basket. And Russ gets up, as the Thunder generally tends to do when an amazing play happens, and he yells something. And the fan asked him to watch his language because there's a kid sitting right in front of me uh, on that baseline seat. And so the, Russell doesn't care one bit that, you know, he's wearing and this, this kid is right in front of him. Uh, and he starts getting into it with this fan. The, the fan wasn't the kid's parent, but he was seated next to the kid. Uh, and he was, I guess, trying to protect the kid's ears. So uh, Russell goes proceeds to, to say, you know, I'm a grown man. Uh, you know, you don't like it, do something, basically. And he threw some more choice words in there uh, toward the guy. So I'm sure that guy walked away thinking that Russell wasn't the best best uh, player or person in the NBA. And, and to me, it's like, you know, I've heard stories like that about Russell in the past from various people. I've heard good sides, both good and – I mean, both sides, both good and bad. Um, 
But it's like only the only time people will really understand it is when something like that happens to them. And because you don't have the access to Russell Westbrook or any of these guys in the NBA for the most part, the 99% of the world, you'll never really understand what someone is like. You only cheer for them because of what they do uh, and what you see on television, the commercials you see, uh, the things they endorse, things like that, and how they play. And they're spectacular athletes. Uh, but it's just when something like that happens, that's the only time you get a true indication of someone and who they are. And the guy's point to, to Westbrook was, yeah, I know you're a grown man, but try to be a human about it. There's a kid here. Uh, let's just try to watch the language. A great, a great example about uh, two things, but a great example of what you're talking about. Kendrick Perkins has this, you know, reputation – externally from people he's just like mean you know Grinch kind of guy on the court he's always you know kind of getting mad at refs getting mad at players his own teammates getting mad at himself he's one of the nicest guys I think any of us have dealt with in any kind of media I mean Barry you've covered so many things over your career Kendrick Perkins up there with the greatest guys to deal with right oh yeah he's up he's he's I mean he's not tall but I mean he's like he's easy to deal with at pretty much all times yeah Yeah. um and then another thing about Russ you Darnell, you wrote about it for the for the Christmas game. I mean, he's he's very active in the community. He in not just uh, you know active because he wants his name out there that he's active. But I think he genuinely cares about the community and helping you know at need families and stuff like that. And to his inner circle, he seems to be friendly uh, and very loyal. He just seems certain people he doesn't seem like in in that you know we're grouped into that because of our job. I think. Um, and, and he makes enemies out of those people. I mean, yeah. you know, real or perceived, he makes like the guy last night. Uh, for the rest of the night, and it was actually comical at that point, any time Russell made a great play, he stare at the – maybe the cameras caught it. You know, people don't know <laughs> what's really going on. But he would stare at the guy right after making a play. And every time Russell did something, or you turned it over or missed the shot or missed the free throw, the guy would stand up and give him a golf clap. It was the greatest thing ever. But for a while there, it was contentious. Oh. Well, the funny, uh, kind of ironic part about all of this is it kind of gives him a somewhat bad perception outside, but I think that is what makes him so good. It's Yeah, it feels He's, he's done a disservice to himself kind of with that interview because of how good he's been the last two games, but nobody's talking about how good he's been. But the reason he is so good, the reason he had that just wild, crazy dunk last night and had one off on the Magic and had that 17-15-17 against the Warriors is because he creates those enemies in his mind on the court. And those include opposing point guards and opposing teams, and he plays with the fire that everyone loves watching. I mean, he's my favorite guy probably in the <laughs> league to watch. You can't take your eyes off him. No, I mean, he even if he's going 3-19, and 19, even if he's going 15-17-15s, you know, whatever he's doing, it's what makes him so good. And that kind of – he did a disservice to himself, I think, a little bit by doing that interview and now that's what people are talking about. But at the same time, I'm kind of ready to start talking about how good the Thunder have been playing, including Russell Westbrook. Last night in Orlando, does anyone – first of all, does anyone have something else to say on the subject or can I move I'm on? I'm good. Move on org. Okay. Uh, last night in Orlando, they, they won two straight now. And on the surface, you'd say the win at home against the Warriors is a better win. I thought they played a better game. I thought they were incredible last night. I don't care if the Magic are terrible. The Magic had no chance. Did you see some of the shots they were hitting in the first half? Well, what, 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 RFD, you had the good stat. What, they're two from two point land. They shot something like 27, 27 of, of 32. 27 of 30 in the first half. Yeah, just, that's unbelievable. On, on two pointers. Yeah, it was. In some ways, it looked like it looked like uh, the varsity against the JV. Yeah, I mean, I I don't. If the Thunder are playing that well, there's no team in the league that can beat them. I mean, uh, and you know Orlando stinks, but they, you know, they'd beaten the Rockets and the Bulls in in the last week or so. So yeah, I, I mean, mean they, they, they're they, not. No, they just had, they got just it was a tidal wave last night. Yeah, they just had no chance early, and I think they realized that. I'd say it was probably the best game of the season, and I kind of I wrote about it a little bit. I've never I don't remember a Thunder game with as many like highlights. You know. Alley oop dunks, the crazy Westbrook dunk, the the over the shoulder pass. Well, you can get so um, yeah. The, the Kendrick the, Perkins Hakeem Olajuwon move. Well, I the mean, Thunder when they get in a groove, mm-hmm. you know, you call it a tidal wave. They can be really hard to stop, and especially in transition, because virtually every, especially when Adams is on the court, everybody out there is athletic, and uh, so they they just sort of. It seemed to me they they. 
it seemed to me that they've sort of li- got the the weight was lifted off of them is what it amounted to. The weight was lifted off of them. Yeah. Um I I agree. Darnell, have you, do you remember a game they've had so many highlights? Uh, I'd go back to about maybe the first five minutes of that Knicks game, Russell Westbrook, uh, his return. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking like alley oops, crazy plays. Though, I mean, they were just they overwhelmed the Knicks for sure. Well, but how, many, then, how many how many dunks did Perk have? He had two or three, didn't he? Last night, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. and much better than the dunk was the. Did, I mean, you saw it, yeah, right? The, the up and under, yeah, the yeah. up and under, where Brian Davis went. Kendrick Perkins <laughs> just broke Kyle O'Quinn's <laughs> ankles. Which seemed a little bold, but the fact that you can even make that statement, I thought was pretty hilarious. But I mean, oh. that was that was as good as I've seen him. Are you guys ready to say, hey, they may be turning this thing around? Because if you look at it, they had the five day break. They came out cold against the Rockets, had that disaster first quarter, down forty to eighteen. Really, they played the last three quarters in Houston pretty good. They played the Warriors game great, and then they were just great in Orlando last night. I mean, obviously. It's a wait and see, and let's see how the rest of this trip goes. But do you feel like they could be turning stuff around? I think it's possible. Yeah, I mean, we've seen good signs. We've yeah, seen good signs. For like sure. you said, ever since the first, uh, the second quarter of that Houston game, they played great basketball. Um, they still couldn't really get stops when when needed in the final three quarters against the Rockets. But you know, I think the defense, uh, like we've all said, is still the biggest concern. And until they get that corrected, I, I don't think you can really say that they've turned the corner. Uh, you know, obviously they played great defense last night, but as you guys have said, the, the Magic are just awful, um, are just not very good. So uh, let's see it against a really good team again, and, and then I think you could say that, you know, maybe they're back on the right track. Yeah, the, the, only, the unfortunate thing for the Thunder is they're playing at this level for, after two games, but now they hit a bad stretch. Four straight games against East, theoretically, playoff teams, and after Miami – it's legitimately three good teams in a row, Washington, Atlanta, and Cleveland. So, uh, or maybe it's Atlanta, whatever the order is. But th- that'll be a tough test even if you're playing well because those are three good teams. But, you know, you can't get it turned around until you do start playing well. And so when you start playing well, maybe you do have it turned around. Yeah, I think maybe the best sign from the last three games, I believe the assist numbers have been 27, 28, and 27, something like that. They're spreading the wealth. Which, I mean, we're talking about a team that, you know, a few weeks ago they were dead last in the NBA and it says somewhere around like 18.5 per game. And to have 27, 28, and 27, which the Golden State Warriors lead the NBA average of 27 per game right now, that is a huge sign for a team who we've talked about, you know, has had, you know, ball movement issues in the past. We had talked in the preseason about getting better. It's been great the last few games. They, were, Especially last night. Well, they were really sharing. You know, uh, against Golden State, they had – Five players in double figures, and Reggie had nine, mm-hmm. and all of them he, he he didn't play the last five or six minutes, so he would, uh, you know, six virtually in double figures. Then last night seven, and when the Thunder does that, they're generally, you know, they've had a whole lot of games in the last five years where Durant has thirty four and Westbrook twenty seven, and Serge twelve, and then somebody and six. then it's single digits the rest, and they sure. don't win. Now a lot of times they do win, but sometimes, but they don't lose very often. When they've got six in double figures. Kevin Durant was dropping some nice passes in that first half last night. I thought that was I thought that was what really keyed the that, you know, from there everyone kind of took off. But he can be a good passer. He you know the problem is, and I know this has a minutes restriction. Westbrook's a good passer too. Yeah, when he's willing, he's a very good passer. Um Durant coming in, I know a little bit is minutes restriction, but he's averaging, you know, under four assists. And last year he averaged five and a half. Um Last night, I think he had eight or so. When he when he's doing that, I think the Thunder are at their best. Yeah, and getting and you know RFD wrote this, about this after after Golden State. Getting Serge involved is important, and Dion Waiters has now strung together what four straight games, a solid ball, and you know Morrow Morrow didn't shoot well last night, but you know he will. And Reggie, frankly, has played better in the last couple of games for sure. So you know, there's a bunch of good signs. Bunch of good signs. Let me tell you what. We know, you know, a lot of talk about trading Reggie and all that. But if Robertson can, you know, if he can hang in there and, and not be d- disastrous offensively as a starter, that bench they bring in, who brings in Reggie Jackson, Deion Waiters, and Anthony Morrow off the bench? I mean, that's a – Offensively, yeah. Offensively, no, that's, a, that's a brigade. And that's that's to the point where you got 
three, you know, the naturally streaky guys. Any of them can be hot or cold. But if you have three of them, you can put them in and go, you know, you figure out early who's hot tonight, and then you ride that guy. Yeah. But that kind of brings me to the next uh, discussion I want to have. You mentioned can Andre Robertson not be a disaster on offense so they can keep starting him. I mean, he was, you know, everyone played well last night. He actually, besides the air ball free throw, which, my God. but it, It's possible it was the shortest foul shot I've ever seen above the YMCA level. Well, they had that Tony Parker one. I kind of put it in behind Tony Parker. But I think the ref had said something to him. But Tony Parker so he, one time had a free throw, and it went like five feet. But it just looked like it was awful. Um, but, yeah, anyway, he was decent last night. But we've kind of been talking about it. I've, I've written, I've wrote it a little bit, but. We've talked about it, you know, internally. I don't think any of us think Andre Robertson should be starting anymore. Not if, I thought it was a good idea, but I don't think he can keep doing it playing the way he is because yeah. people are just totally, you know, they, they, they've totally ignored him. And here's the deal about Andre Robertson. When the Thunder offense is working pretty well, Robertson's valuable because he moves. But when the Thunder offense sort of stagnates, it exasperates because of Robertson, because when he's standing still, he's worthless. He's not. You know, Anthony Moore can go stand in the corner and be as valuable as anybody on the court because you gotta you got to guard him and you got to space the floor and, you know, open holes. Andre Robertson standing still is worthless. So the Thunder, if they're going to play Andre Robertson, the ball's got to move and that offense has to flow. Agreed. Um <clears throat> But Darnell, where are you on it? Because I know you think they're going to keep starting Andre Robertson to the playoffs at least. But do you think they should? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm off the Andre Robertson bandwagon simply because they got a new shooting guard. Yeah, and that's one of my gripes with Scott Brooks is you know you don't have to always do the same thing. And you know I understand consistency is great, and there's a lot of things that can benefit a team by being consistent and sticking to what you do. But when you get a new piece uh, and things change, you, know, you might want to try something else if, if you have if you feel like you've got a better option. And right now, Deion Witters certainly looks like he's a better option. Um, but Because his defense, frankly, has been a pleasant surprise. You know, we all thought that he could put up points. But the way he's playing defensively, I think, you know, he's, he's earned a – an opportunity to at least get in that starting unit and see if he can hold his own, um, especially when Dion or when uh, Andre Robertson isn't really being effective at either end. The and the the strange thing to me is I think Scott Brooks kind of realizes he has a better option and he's been divvying out his minutes like it. I mean, if you look in the last four games, Andre Robertson has played way less than Dion Waiters. And if you think about it, Andre, what's who are probably the two teams you'd think Andre Robertson is considered the most valuable against? Probably well, the Houston Rockets because he can guard James Harden, Warriors. and the Golden State Warriors because he's supposed to guard Clay Thompson. He played he played eight minutes against the Rockets and thirteen minutes against the Warriors. Meanwhile, Dion Waiters played thirty one minutes against the Rockets and thirty seven minutes against the Warriors. So to me, that signals, you know, you've already realized Waiters is your best option because he gives you offensively his his kind of his gift. He can you know he scored four straight games over fifteen points, but he's also given you enough on the defensive end to rely on having him out there. Andre Robertson never closes games. He he He's never playing really extended minutes in games. So I don't really understand why you start him. To me, he would serve best as a defensive specialist off the bench where, hey, Clay Thompson's really lighting up Deion Waiters tonight. We need somebody to go out there in, in a different look. Westbrook had him for five minutes. Hey, let's throw Andre Robertson for a five-minute spurt in the middle of the game. Uh, that That's just kind of my opinion on I think Deion Waiters should be starting. And I, I kind of think by the end of the season he will be. I sort of do too. Well, what? here's the, here's the thing. Two 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 quick things about Andre Robertson. One, people talk about guys not guarding him. It was it pretty, pretty much reached a, a a boiling point last night with Elster Payton. Uh, he picked up one quick foul early, in like the first four seconds, and then he picked up his second one, a two and a half minutes later. And I was surprised that Jacques Vaughn left him in the game, and then I saw what he was doing. He switched him off of West and put him on Andre Robertson. And he only barely put him on Andre Robertson, but he was sagging off of him so much digging and basically doubling Steven Adams in the paint. He was ignoring Andre. So uh, if teams are going to play Andre Robertson like that, and 
Uh, and I think they will continue to do that as the scouting reports circulate. I mean, here we are at the halfway point of the season. Teams have really figured out that the guy can't shoot a lick. So uh, I think that will hurt them more long term uh, than it has. Then we've even seen it hurt them so far in the first half of the season. The second thing is I don't see it changing. You know, even though we all agree that it probably should at this point, I think Scott Brooks is going to stick to it. And I don't think he's going to change it until it's desperation time like we've seen in the playoffs when – he set Tabo Tuffalosha against Memphis. He set him against the Spurs, um, you know, in those final few games when they got into that hole. I think that's the only time Scott Brooks is going to finally say, hey, we got to do something else. We'll see. It'll be interesting. <clears throat> By the way, a, a quick pause on this podcast. I, I deserve a little bit of congratulations. Uh, Serge Ibaka hit four threes last night. Meaning he has hit 60 on the season and before the season, Barry. Well, I don't know if you, you're aware. You, you we did the, an over under podcast. You had the over. Why? Well, first of all, I I created the over unders. You know, I, I I'm. You set like, the parameters. I set I before I took the over on that. I set the over at 60, and Darnell almost stormed out of the building. He thought it was so ridiculous that I even set it at 60. <laughs> and then when I took the over, he almost fainted. And uh, I just want to say it is, what's today, January? Well, it's game 40. Is We're not halfway <laughs> We're home. not halfway through, and Serge Ibaka hit number 60 last night. Can I get at least a golf clap from you, Darnell? I'll give you a golf clap that it took you 30 minutes to actually bring it up. Here's the deal. You know, Serge Ibaka, you know, he enters the league as Bill Russell. He might leave the league as Ray Allen. That's bold. Ryan Anderson, maybe. Hey. What, Barry, because me and Darnell have talked at nauseum about Serge's threes. I think it's, you know, you got to do it. He's a top 14. He's shooting, you know, however many he shot, about 200 this season. I think 140, actually. He's shooting 41%. That's like 14th in the league. I think you got a weapon like that. He's clearly a top level three point shooter. You got to keep going to it. Darnell's more, hey, get on the block, you know, rip rebounds. There should be a mix of it, obviously. We both kind of go to extremes on the argument. Where are you on Two it? things. One is, I don't mind him shooting a ton of threes as long as he does mix it up. And frankly, in the last few wood games, I've seen him doing more. He really got with it against Golden State, I thought. Um, going to the hoop, getting a bunch of rebounds. Um, last night I saw some of that. You know, everything was working, so you didn't have to do much of anything. Um, so as long as he's doing that. And here's the other thing. Somebody, if the floor gets spread, I don't care who's spreading it. Anthony Morrow, Deion Waiters, Serge Ibaka. When the floor gets spread, that's fabulous news for Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook. Someone mentioned this to me. Kevin Durant, since he came back, has not been, had not, had not been attacking the rim very much. That changed Friday night with Golden State. He was much more aggressive, much more in attack mode. And we saw a lot of that again last night. Everything worked. But that's when Durant's at his best is not when he's just standing there. You know, he, he's the guy that can sort of get and fall in love with the three-point line. You want Kevin Durant attacking. And the one way he can attack the best is, is if somebody like Serge is spreading, spreading out, the floor, no especially it. taking a big man out. Mm-hmm. So I, I like it when he shoots the threes, and particularly since he's making them. Yeah, and one argument people have is, hey, he's not rebounding as much. Uh, you know, his rebounds are down, and they are. I think he was eight point eight last year. He's something about seven point four this year. But that's that's not an issue with the Thunder team. They're number one in the NBA in rebounds. Serge Ibaka doesn't rebound a ton, even as a four, because guess what? Everyone on the rebound, everybody rebounds. Everybody rebounds. Russell Westbrook, probably the best rebounding point guard in the league. Andre Robertson, a great rebounder for Kevin two. Kevin Durant is an unbelievable defensive rebounder. For for a three, he's a great he's rebounder. A Steven Adams, solid. Yeah. I mean, Kendrick Perkins come off the bench, good rebounder. They they have yeah, good they, rebounders they do have good all rebounders. over. So if you have that Reggie's many— Reggie's a good rebounder. Yeah. If you have that many good rebounders, nobody's going to rebound at right. a high, high rate yeah. all the time. Yeah. Serge Ibaka has If game. everybody's getting six, nobody can get 16. Yeah. So, you know, maybe he should attack more. He's actually – hey, that move he had against the Warriors surge when he did a little pump, get yeah. to the rim, that was a nice move. Darnell, where are you at on this argument now? Because I, as he hit 60 last night, I saw you kind of subtweet me and say, well, eight of his ten shots have been from three tonight. You know what? You're the second person that has accused me of subtweeting. You're a subtweeter. You I, subtweeted I me last night. There's no doubt about it. That was a subtweet. people should know. You of all people should know, I don't have a problem going at it with people, especially on Twitter. I don't care if it's real life or Twitter. But That's if you true. come at me on Twitter, I will definitely come back at you on Twitter. So why on earth would I subtweet anyone, especially you? Um, 
But anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for him. You know, he's, he's evolved into a really, really good three-point shooter. Uh, I think it's percentage-wise he's the second best on the team. Um, it, it's great. I think it's good for the Thunder. I don't think it's the best thing for the Thunder long term um, because, as we saw, even in that Orlando game, he has a tendency to fall in love with it. And like Barry, you know, I'm not asking him to get on the low block with his back to the basket. That shit failed a long time ago. I gave up on that a long time ago. But I'd like to see him mix up some other things, play more like he did against Golden State as opposed to what he did last night against Orlando. You know, use that pump fake, get to the rim. Uh, if you can get on the block every now and again and command a double team, try to make the open pass to make your teammates better, get them an open shot. Um, you know, those are the things I'd like to see. Get to the free throw line more. He's not going to get to the free throw line camping out at the three-point line. And even though they got two guys that are really great at getting to the free throw line, uh, you know, the more the merrier. It never hurts to get more guys there, especially with Serge being so physical, uh, so big, so strong. He should live at the line uh, at times, but his game is not conducive to it. Um, but the last thing I'll say about it is, you know, it's all great and fine and everything that he's, he's uh, you know, made 63-pointers this season. But I believe his PER is, the second lowest, his, his lowest since his rookie year, second lowest of his career. So, you know, while he has rounded out his game and extended his range a little bit, I'll say that, not rounded out his game, he's extended his range, but he's having a worse offensive season. Uh, he's not shooting. He's not – overall, he's not shooting as well. I think that's because when you shoot threes – your percentage. 41% is a good percentage, but it's not compared if you, if you shoot his, no threes. I bet his points per shot is still very good his, his, as far as, you know. What, true shooting percentage? Yeah, true shooting percentage, points per shot, whatever. Um, so, I mean, in, in that regard, yeah. I mean, I think he's fine. I think, honestly, yeah, he is kind of, to me, he's having a little bit worse season, but th- that kind of, to me, has nothing to do with him shooting threes on the offensive end. I just think he hasn't been as consistently good and active and involved well, defensively and going after shots, stuff like that. <laughs> he doesn't look as energized to me, but I don't think that has to do with him floating to the three-point line on offense. We've also seen with the Russell Westbrook voids of the last two years in the playoffs against Memphis and then last year sitting out with the Russell. And this year without either of them. Serge is not the kind of player that sort of no, he's not. Elevates into the spotlight no. when the stars sit down. He needs the stars to maintain his. He's a spot up three point shooter, which who needs to be open. That's the one good thing about Serge's threes, but limited part about his three point shooting. All of his threes are good shots. Yeah, he doesn't ta- take any. Over, you know what yeah, I mean? They're always a wide open. Good. That's why he's such a good percentage shooter. I would say maybe. Five times this year, I've seen him shoot a rushed three. Yeah, and not even rushed three. The first time Serge Ibaka takes an off-the-dribble contested three, which we kill. Sometimes we kill Westbrook or Durant when they do that. That'll be the first time Serge yeah, does he it. He's do never that. taken no, he an off-the-dribble three. He doesn't do that. Uh, so that's a good part about it, but that also shows kind of where he's limited. And, I mean, I agree. I think part of the reason his PR is down because he didn't have his stars out there to get him the shots that he loves. And that, that to me, is disappointing. Uh, you know, we can sit up here and, you know, make excuses for him and say that's not who he is, he's a role player, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, that that disappoints me that, you know, he's not who we thought he was coming into this season, and that's the borderline all-star guy who potentially could have made the all-star team this year. He's just not who we thought he was, and, and that, to me, is disappointing. I don't know. I mean, I'm not surprised by that fact. I mean, he is who he is. Uh, I think you can still be an all-star as a defensive Star, you know what I mean? Like in past years, he's been defensive player of the year candidate, like, and then an incredible piece to have around superstars that fits his role perfectly. We've seen, we've seen what the Thunder looks like defensively without Serge Ibaka, and it's not a pretty sight. Yeah, it's so, not a pretty sight. Darnell, I believe you were the one the other day that said to me, "Do you even think about defense?" Well, in like the Serge argument, especially looking at past years and not calling him an All Star, are you not looking at defense? No, I'm looking at defense, but, you know, most of the argument is about the three-point shooting. That's the discussion. And if we're talking who bringing up all-star, you know, his defense is not worthy in and of itself of an all-star bid. So, you know, I don't think the two go hand in hand. I think I think it is. You know, I don't think he's playing the incredible defense he has in the past this season. But I think in past years, if the forward wasn't so stacked, I think it would have been. I mean, Ben Wallace made the all-star team. There's plenty of guys, defense first guys that make the All Star team. Yeah, although I mean, it's time, it, yeah, it's not, Wall, let's not put them in the same sentence. I'm, well, I'm just saying Ben Wallace is a lot worse offensively than Serge Ibaka. Serge no, it's Ibaka's, a good point. But what the difference is, Ben Wallace, when he made the All Star team that year, when the Pistons were so good, 
It was not a deep East. This is a deep West. It's hard to make the All Star team. I agree, but I just wouldn't say Serge Ibaka is like not an All Star level because he can't create his own shot. I mean, for as good as Serge Ibaka is defensively, guys, let me just put the Ben Wallace is was a much better defender than Serge Ibaka. Yeah, Serge Ibaka is great at blocking shots, protecting the rim, but Ben defense. Like for that thing, for that role, Kendrick Perkins is more that role on this team than Serge Ibaka. Um, and that's not to get anything away from Serge. That's just let's not lose sight of how Ben Wallace was defensively. No, I agree. I mean, Ben Wallace is one of the best defenders ever, but especially in his prime, Ben Wallace. But you know, Serge, I just think it's I just think it's unfair to say just because he can't do one thing, he shouldn't have ever been an All Star. I think if the league was a little more watered down, he would have been an All Star. But anyway, we're heading forward. Where are you at with this team? Where what's their road trip coming up? They got they're in Miami tomorrow. In Atlanta. No, Wizards on Wednesday, Wait, okay, Atlanta, Atlanta Friday, Friday. Yeah. Cavs on Sunday. I'm thinking three and one. I'm after seeing them last night, three I and think one the rest of the week. I think that five game layoff gave them a real good rhythm. I think they came out cold, obviously, against the Rockets, but I think they're about to hit a hit a rhythm. I'm saying three and one just because I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be real hard. I mean, we're talking about the one two teams in the East right now, the Hawks and Wizards, and then it looks like the Cavs are kind of catching a rhythm because LeBron seems to be back in a groove. So I think three and one will be a good record, and I think they're going to get it. <laughs> I think three and one would be a great record. Yeah, and I'm, they're not going to get it. I'll say two and two. Darnell. Yeah, I'm going to go two and two. Um, you know, I think they're going to either lose it. I think they definitely could lose at Cleveland, but uh, that Washington, Atlanta. I don't know. I don't know. I think they could drop one of those as well. Atlanta might not lose again. They may just I'm, win. I'm really they may, they that, might man. win all What's, the rest of their what? games. I watched them play the Bulls. You know, I haven't watched a ton of Atlanta games, but I saw they were playing in Chicago, which you know you would think would be a really tough game. And I was and I just I was at my house and I had time to watch it, and there was no Thunder game. Um, and I was like, you know what, I got to watch this Atlanta team. How are they so good? They're twenty six and two or something since Thanksgiving, and they just dissected the Bulls. They pass the ball. They pass the ball so well. Everyone on the team can shoot well. Or at least through the starters. Sapp, Corver, Tig, all those guys. Corver's unbelievable. You know Corver's shooting like 53% from three this year? He, he's getting talk for MVP. <laughs> okay, that's a little bold. But that's a, guy, that's a guy that, in you know, and we just had the surge argument. I know he doesn't do a ton defensively. He's pretty, you know, he's he's better than people think defensively. He's a guy that should be an all-star. Just The stuff he does, I think he went 7-9 and nine from three against the Bulls. Like, he was so unguardable. He hit some and one three in the corner that, I mean, it was crazy. But... That I mean, I think this team is still underrated despite the the great record. Darnell, I, what do you think about your wins? I just want. I, no, I was I was gonna say something about the Atlanta. I I just I don't know, guys. I haven't been this fired up. I've never been this fired up to to see a game in Atlanta. Um, yeah, but I, I really ever. want to see this team. I want to <coughs> see this team play live. And I want to see them against one of the best teams, talent-wise, in the, in the Western Conference and the Thunder. Um, you know, I, I think this could be a game where either the Thunder could struggle and Atlanta proves that they're for real if they haven't already, or the Thunder could just go in there and just roll and and really kind of um, show that Atlanta maybe isn't as good as, as everyone thinks they are. Um, but they've they've beaten some really good teams and they they're off to a great start, no doubt. I just can't wait to see that game. Yeah, that's going to be good. Fa- are the fans turning out in Atlanta? Yeah, I heard they sold out like uh, you know six or so straight games, really? something like that. I mean, it was it wasn't good early in the season, obviously, kidding. especially coming off the thing that happened this summer uh, with Danny Ferry and stuff. But yeah, apparently they're selling out. I that that would be a good game to get. You got a nice little trip, Darnell. I'm, I'm a little jealous. Miami, DC. Atlanta, and then although you got to go to Cleveland, that's going to be a good game Sunday, I think. Yeah, I think that's, that could be a really good game or a dud. I mean, it's the final of, game of a five-game trip for the Thunder, uh, and Cleveland is fired up now. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to play great, but they got a lot to play for, sort of similar to the Thunder, and, you know, the Thunder could ro- roll, run into a buzzsaw in that game. So uh, I think that could either be a great game or a stinker. We'll see. It's going to be an interesting week. 
And beyond that, we will talk to you again. Anyone else got anything else they want to say about the Thunder? Westbrook, anything? Sounds like a no. I got I got nothing. <laughs> All right. We'll uh we'll talk to you guys again. I was hoping you two would say you liked me, but I, I, I guess that's not gonna happen. I don't know. The the jury's I'll, still out. I'll pull a Russell Westbrook. I'll pull what Russell did with me. I love you, Barry. <laughs> but he doesn't like me. Anyway. Uh we'll talk to you again next week. See ya. Durant pull up jumper off the rim and oh and the thunder win. Oh, come on, let's sing the thunder song. All right. When, when you, you hear, hear the sound of thunder, thunder, don't you get too scared. Just grab your thunder buddy and say these magic words.